off to the space race in a new series over on Disney Plus, The Right Stuff. The fourth episode is now up and I just watched it, so stick with me and I'll break it all down after the intro. Well, hello there. My name is Jeremy and welcome back to Freeform Disney, where I talk about all aspects of Disney, from the animated movies to the theme parks to Star Wars, Marvel, and Pixar, and the TV shows, and everything else in between. And that is why it's Freeform. And keep coming back every day for new daily content. If you're not subscribed yet, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Today, we're once again looking at Disney's latest drama series, The Right Stuff, which is the story of the Mercury 7 astronauts. Now, the fourth episode is called Advent. Without any further time to waste, let's jump on in and break down what happened. And I'm going to break it into four different sections because we had four major storylines in here. So first off, there is the Chris Craft piece of this. And Deke also is actually pretty big here. One of the impetuses of the episode is that we see that Russia launched Luna 3 and, well, got the first pictures from the far side of the moon. And NASA is seeming to consistently be a step behind the Russians every step of the way in the space race. And hey, it's October 1959, we're gonna go all the way up through December. So we see Gordo testing in the capsule, and, well, that doesn't go ahead and work too well anyway because there are all kinds of issues with it, so you end up getting the astronauts, led by Deke in this case, confronting Gilruth and Kraft over this problem. And then we move forward a little bit later, and we've got issues because they brought in Von Braun, Werner Von Braun, the famous Nazi who built lots of rockets there, who also, well, through Operation Paperclip here in the US, did a lot of our rocket work, and a lot of work in NASA too, for that matter. Now, Chris Craft has a lot of objection to that, and we see that with Gilruth, but hey, he doesn't have any real choice in the matter because, well, he's not in charge of it. Gilruth and people higher up than Gilruth, for that matter, are in charge. So Kraft has to play along, and we see him meeting Von Braun over in his hotel room, and it's just a tense, tense interaction between the two. And, well, at the launch the next day, the rocket pops its top, and the booster is still on the launch pad, still going, which is, of course, a big problem. And guess what? Von Braun's going to go ahead and apparently have had it shot to go ahead and hopefully relieve pressure, which Kraft races to stop, because that could also go catastrophically wrong and actually cause the rocket to explode. So, yeah, we're just going to take the 12 hours to have the thing eventually come back. And... Oh, the confrontation between the two of them after that as well. Oof, tense, messy. Oh, yeah. And then let's jump in a bit more on Deke. So Deke ends up over at the bar at the motel down in Cape Canaveral here, and this is like Christmas Eve, it seems. With the really bad weather, there are worse outcomes than going ahead and not being in Miami. And that means he ends up talking with Werner Von Braun in there. They get talking about how controlling Chris Kraft is, and Von Braun tells Deke that it's Kraft's way of flying from the ground, and that's his real goal there. Deke heads over to talk to Chris Kraft, and Chris Kraft is over pouring over the data, trying to figure out anything he can to try to identify what the problem was. Now, of course, there are plenty of other people working on that up in Virginia as well, but that doesn't stop him from trying to also do what he can as well. And Deke tells him what Von Braun told him. To which Chris Kraft is like, yeah, the Navy rejected me from flight training because burned my hand badly when I was three. Not that he says that he's just trying to control everything from the ground. That's a different matter. And I guess the two bond a little there too because heck, Deke lost a finger when he was young. Although apparently the one finger you can actually lose and still be a pilot. <laughs> and well, no, Deke was never on Von Braun's side on this. Because Deke hates Nazis. And screw him. On top of all that, he's getting soaked at the bar in a Santa beard while you're trying to figure this out. I can tell you who I'd rather have as a wingman. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Me too. Me too. So it was a nice arc for Chris Craft right there. And also really nice to actually get to see one of the other four of the Mercury 7, other than just our main three. So we got to see Deke a little bit in this one, and that was nice. Well, on to the other three stories, which of course are the big three. So, 
We'll start with Gordo. This gets into another big piece with Lurlane. The person he was cheating on his wife with, it led to their separation before he got into the NASA space program here. So Gordo ends up seeing Lurlene in public at some event where she gets a card to him and he ends up dumping that card in the trash. And we see Gordo later with his family. And we get this interesting comment from one of the kids where Santa doesn't go to Russia. <laughs> at least uh, in Gordo's favor, he, he goes ahead and corrects that. The kids over there aren't any different. Bear in mind this is the midst of the Cold War at this point in time. And oh, definitely a lot of anti-Russian sentiment at the time. And during the course of that, Trudy discovers the torn card from Lurlene in the trash, which, as we end up seeing, has Lurlene's room number over at a hotel. And please come, I'm there till Christmas. Yeah. Yo. And then later, Gordo takes off driving to look for a tree, even though they have the plastic one. But he's always hated that and always wanted live trees each year. That's not suspicious at all, right? Trudy also ends up heading out and goes out to Lurlene's hotel room afterwards. And does not find Gordo there when she goes there, but confronts Lurlane. We get this interesting confrontation between the two, which both of them seemingly knowing that the other one is living a fantasy. And, well, what Lurlane says to Trudy is that you never wanted to support Gordo, you just wanted to be him. Because remember, Trudy's a pilot herself. Trudy ends up writing Lurlene a check, because after all, that's all she thinks that Lurlene's really there for. And while she's there, she also intercepts a phone call, which is from Gordo. Although she doesn't say anything on the line at the time. Which then leads to their confrontation after she eventually comes back home, because Gordo was home well before. And they have this big confrontation, really wondering about everything. Is it just to protect your image? Is it just for the girls that you came back? Or do you still love me? Well, what we get out of Gordo is that, yeah, he does. He was more interested in the NASA space program for another shot with the two of them. What a mess. I mean, this has always been the show's major piece for getting conflict-type drama in a relationship. And it still is exactly that right here, too. But definitely some good acting from both of them in this one. On to Alan Shepard's piece of this. And now, Alan Shepard's piece of this is the best part of this episode here. And it's got a fair bit going on in it. We start off with some Christmas gift shopping. And we find out that Alan's niece, Judith, is staying with them because his sister-in-law just went ahead and died. Yo. And also, a little bit of Barbie product placement in there at the same time, too. Just saying. Now, that may reflect a little reality, too, but still. <laughs> now, we get to see how much Luis is affected by the death of her sister. And she makes an interesting comment about how she's surprised that she misses her sister the way she does. So, clearly, there's a lot of distance between those two. But it's a nice moment in there in the house. And also during that conversation, we allude to Alan just not being on great terms with his parents. And guess who's coming over because it's the holidays. Wee! <laughs> so Alan's parents come on over and his father is in his military uniform in there. And yeah, you can certainly tell Alan's not uh, pleased to see them. Gotta take a good stiff drink before meeting them and put on a good face though. Now, the dinner scene, that's where everything really comes to a head. And, oh, man, there's barbs coming out of the father right off the bat in this table. And, oof, what a mess. Now, one of the things that apparently happened is that the shepherds there, they went ahead and changed Judas' name because they decided it was too close to Julie, which was one of their two kids. But that's certainly a point that Alan's father goes ahead and uses against them because, oh, well, you know, it's a Navy man solution, the easy way out. And it does not seem like Judith was actually really consulted about her name being changed at all. But regardless, the father's just using that all to go ahead and further this fight and talk about making people uncomfortable. Whoa. Yeah. And hey, when he's knocking his way and Judith is sitting next to him and just, or Martha, whatever we want to call her. And she happens to put her elbow on the table. Hey, that gives the father a great excuse to go ahead and take out his anger by physically abusing her. Yay! Just slam the elbow into the table. Good times. Yeah. 
One can imagine that didn't exactly de-escalate the situation any. Alan goes ahead and tries to confront this a bit with, Hey, this is my house, Dad. I'll handle discipline around here. And the father doesn't seem like he handled much of anything. There's no flag out front. Couldn't help but notice that. That's some example you are setting. But of course, discipline has never really been your strong suit, has it? <laughs> Alan making a big point and then banging his elbows up onto the table as he clears his throat and responds. And he's decided it's this specific issue with his dad this time around is, well, he's jealous of Alan because, hey, he's actually doing something more important than anything his dad's ever done. And of course, his father just goes and scoffs at that and says, oh, you're not doing anything. The Russians are doing all of this. And look, you're doing nothing. Where will you be when the next war comes? Gonna go ahead and beat the Soviets with press conferences and staged photo shoots? We Tense silence. Alan does get the last line in there after his wife gets up to break the silence to go get dessert, try to de-escalate things. But he gets one last lick. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that Martha's all settled into the guest room. You and Mom are gonna have to get a hotel for the night. And then he goes back to eating and we get a little more silence before the end of that. As much as the dialogue was really good in here, there was also so much just in tense silences and the acting and the faces and oh yes, this was by far definitely the best piece and best scene within this episode. But that's not quite the end of the Alan piece because we do get a little piece later where he's actually spending time with, shall we call her Judith or Martha at this point, Christmas Day and well... They do go outside and put a flag up on the pole, and he gives that as a job to her. And they bond a little over that as, hey, you know, something to be able to have as a routine, and the, the value of it. Really, for Judith slash Martha, this is the point where she really starts to understand that, hey, this is her home for good at this point, because she's even asking. And then in the conversation, we get her saying that she wants to choose her own name, then, if that's the case. And, hey, what name do you have in mind? And her response is a touching response, considering she's like, Alan, which as Alan responds, eh, that might get you in a little trouble in school down the road. <laughs> uh, and he suggests, how about Alice? And she agrees. And so, yes, whether we call her Judith or Martha earlier, well, Alice is what we end up calling her here. And the two share a nice hug and a bonding moment, which... You can see Alan's surprised a little there, too. And it's just a nice moment. We have a good arc during this episode here. And for what it's worth, yes, that story about being named Judith and actually having switched the name eventually to Alice, that is actually true as well. And yes, it was originally changed because the Shepherds do have a daughter named Julie. So <laughs> a bit of reality sitting in there, too, amongst however much fictionalized aspect is sitting on top of this. But still... It's super nice. Love this section right here. And then let's jump on into our final section, John Glenn. So John Glenn's big piece on this is continuing where he was from before, which is, well, really trying to make sure he's that first person in the capsule. He's talking with Annie early on, and they're busy exercising and talking at the same time, and he's worried that John F. Kennedy, if he gets to become president, would bail on the space program, as it was actually Eisenhower's project originally, and when things change administrations, they don't necessarily keep going. And because of this, he's even talking about potentially backing Nixon, because Nixon's people had reached out to him, and since he's one of only two Democrats amongst the astronauts... Well, that could actually be a huge boost for Nixon. And Annie disagrees with that one and really gets it to him and says, hey, you got power, use it, change his mind. I've always loved the relationship the two of them have. It seems like one of the more genuine relationships here where they're really together on the same page. Especially because the other two, oh, well... We can talk about the messes with Gordo and Trudy, or we can talk about the mess between Alan and Luis and everything that Alan does on the side. Ooh, that's another matter. Although we should comment an amusing point, I suppose, in a certain sense, is with how much Alan cheats on Luis and how much he was well known to be that kind of a person. Intriguingly, those two stay married until... Until the day Alan dies, and then, heck, she dies, I think, a month later or something like that. So, go figure, right? 
Of course, I should note John Glenn and Annie stayed married all the way until death do them part in that case, too, when John Glenn died. Anyway, a little off topic right there. So we watch a little bit later, John Glenn's going on the phone, contacting congressman after congressman, senator after senator, trying to go ahead and talk to people and reach the way to John F. Kennedy as well. And hey, he eventually gets a call back from Bobby Kennedy. He puts it out there. Hey, let's say your brother gets the nomination. He wants to win Ohio in the fall? <laughs> and we get to the New Year's celebration, which is where we bring the end of the episode and we bring everybody back together. But even then, there's this through line that is stronger for John Glenn in the end portion because he's expecting JFK to show up there. Heck, he even went ahead and told Scott Carpenter, Scotty over there, that JFK would be there. Because he's the only other Democrat amongst the rest of the astronauts of the Mercury 7. Although, Scott certainly doesn't keep it a secret as he was requested. That one quickly right off to another person, and etc, etc. Now, it's interesting, in the bathroom we have Alan Shepard over here, John Glenn, practicing a little in there, and... This is going to definitely come up later because this is part of what we saw in the very beginning of the first episode where Alan Shepard was accusing John Glenn of going behind his back and stabbing him in the back, etc. Because that's exactly what he's doing. He's overplaying political games in order to go ahead and be, try to become the first astronaut as opposed to getting there because he actually is the best astronaut. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, JFK doesn't actually end up showing up. Instead, his special advisor on science shows up, Jerome Wiesner, and nobody is happy here, especially Bob Gilruth and Chris Kraft, because we've already had conversations between Chris Kraft and John Glenn about being a team player and working with them. So, yeah, you wouldn't have invited somebody like that without telling the people up above and in charge of the program? Yeah. Ahem. <laughs> And that kind of finishes off that little piece for now. And then we get our little Happy New Year's piece with lots of happy couples for the end of this. And the last moment of the episode is Alan Shepard wishing John Glenn a Happy New Year and the return of that sentiment. Which also feels very calm before the storm, shall we? I was a little tough on the show last week, so where do I sit now? Well, I thought this was definitely the best episode yet. The drama felt more real to me this time and less forced as it has been a bit in certain other cases. The main storylines were definitely good here, and I admit I've given up a little bit on hoping to see much of the other four astronauts. Although, hey, we did get to see one of them. We got to see Deke a bit in here, at least. And also interesting, Chris Craft is looking to be developing into a bigger and bigger character over the course of the show. Heck, we see a lot more of him than we do those four, <laughs> but I digress. And this whole issue between him and our <clears throat> Nazi from Operation Paperclip is sure to develop further in the future. I'm sure it's not the last time we're going to go ahead and talk about it. Oh, and while I say Operation Paperclip, we didn't actually say that phrase during the course of the show. I don't know if we'll mention it later or not. But this episode ultimately seemed to find the balance between the space program and the personal lives of the astronauts that I think the show's been looking for and hasn't really quite found before this. And while the show is certainly far more skewed to personal lives and drama than I'd prefer, I think it's ultimately something I'll find to be okay enough, as long as the quality keeps up to where it was here during this episode. And I'm hoping for more good things next week. Now, in the little teaser for next week, we did see that we are finally going to see them decide on the flight order for the first three astronauts. And we see a fight coming up between John Glenn and Alan Shepard, which, yeah, yeah, that's been building. So, that calm before the storm? Yeah, indeed. And also, there's something going on with Gordo and cameras and not sure what's going on there. Who, who knows? We'll see. Fireworks, indeed. So will this fifth episode catch us up to where we went ahead and teased at the very beginning of the first episode? I guess we'll see next time. At least it looks like it's getting close to where we were. Okay, so we shall see next week. Now first, before I finish out, let me say that next week's video is going to be a little later for me because The Mandalorian Season 2 will be starting. Which means I'm looking to get the video for the right stuff out, let's say later Friday is my intent rather than early Friday as it's been these past few weeks and this week. And hey, with that, 
Well, what about you? Did you think this was the best episode yet? And did you love seeing the dinner scene at the Shepherds as much as I did? Let me know down below in the comments. And thanks so much for watching. If you liked the video, please help me out, give it a like, a share, don't forget to subscribe, and I'll see you back here tomorrow for another new episode of Freeform Disney. Have a magical day, and may the Force be with you. Always.